Hey everybody and welcome to Cold Turkey Holly Tea and today I'm out in the Belcom Centre out in Darndale uh, to meet the great Dublin artist Emmanuel Godson. Hey you doing? Is my hair okay? <laughs> Your hair is fantastic. Dress up. I normally wear a tweed suit for these things. He normally does but he doesn't have it on today because he was working. Then. I'm out here to look at some of the uh, wonderful art that Emmanuel does. He's going to talk to us a little about his own struggle with mental health and um, he also has a portrait for me which I'm going to see. Uh, so let's have a look at some of Emmanuel's work first. Right, so I'm a, a vociferous iconoclast. I, um, my work is very controversial. It's very outspoken against the current left-wing orthodoxies in society. Mm -hmm. So my work um, gets me into trouble a lot of the time. Thankfully, I'm, I'm here in the Bell Centre who sponsors me. They welcomed me in with open arms in, I think it was 2016, that they put my work up on the walls. And um, I've been here ever since. Normally, I get deplatformed from galleries. I don't really get anywhere in the mainstream. But um, I'm well known down here in Darndale for, um, for my work. So um, my work, it has a kind of a sense of humour to it. Sometimes there's jokes in it. It's always laced with little references and meanings and metaphors in the paintings left, right and center. I do um, classical oil reproductions. So um, I, I'd reproduce old classic paintings with um, contemporary references in them. Um, I, I painted Brian Cowan in the nip as uh, Rubens' um, Bacchus one time. It used to be up on the wall, but there was a change of management here and they says, this, this has to come down, you know, it's too controversial. So, um, so the first one is uh, Mary and the Angels. Right, now that's a Bougerou reproduction and it has modern references in it. Okay, this is called Samsung Sonnet. Mm -hmm. And Mary is holding a mobile phone and the angels are playing along to the jingle to get Christ to sleep. And you can see on the ground there's um, wrappers of junk food strewn about and there's even a, a light and cigarette in the corner. Right, so it's as if somebody was just yes. there it was as if someone was just there and he legged it when they seen Christ coming. Now, if you're wondering who that is, right, so it's Satan was there and he legged it. Right, but in, there's, an, there's an allegory, uh, um, a fallacy happening in the environment that the junk food seems to be celebrating who Christ is because you have the Lion King or the Lion Bar and the King Crisps. Right, so it's references to Christ, so it seems to be celebrating his thing. And the whole point of the painting, the punchline is, mm -hmm. if you're wondering what, um, network Mary is on, she's on Virgin Mobile. The second piece up there, that's a Caravaggio's reproduction. The painting is um, a reproduction of Caravaggio's St. Francis of Assisi in Ecstasy. Mine has put a modern twist on it and the title of my piece is called St. Francis and a Sissy on Ecstasy. So he's a gay drug using angel. Right, so he's got big pink fluffy wings. And the rave culture, you know, the smiley face rave culture. So he's on ecstasy. Uh, so, but actually, because it's, um, I was built with our college, TU, Grange Gorman. Last year, I was studying for a degree in fine art in, in, in second year. I went straight into second year as a mature student. And they did a political vendetta hit job on me that because they didn't like my politics. They hated everything about me and about my work. Um, this was one of the pieces that they came up with a new policy mid-project in response to my work that they said um, I'm not allowed to discriminate against gay people in my work, right? Because I used the word sissy. They didn't like the joke. It was just a word. Play. It was just a joke, it was just a paranomasia. And um, so that's what they did. They did a hit job on me. So that's one of the pieces that got me kicked out of college. But um, it's, it's, it's on public display here. I have, I have video of presenting this piece to a bunch of um, the general public and they all fell around laughing at the joke, like nobody was offended. Sure. You know, uh, it's just the, the, the radical Marxist left-wing academics in, in the colleges today, you know, they're, they're doing hit jobs on, on Christian conservative people, just normal people if you don't, if you don't um, buy into the left-wing uh, radical Marxist ideology, then there's, they're, they're going to have a problem with you and they're going to oust you from, from your thing and stifle your career. That's and you'll get them. Right it's happening, world. especially in America. Yeah. There's uh, 
you know, um, there's a problem in society. But that's politics. We won't get into too much politics. Sure. So that's two of them. I hope you like the jokes in them. Absolutely. And the third one is um, we needed we needed a a long horizontal piece for this space, right? This yes. is designed for the space now. The only painting that we could come up with was the Last Supper that would fit that space mm -hmm. nicely because it's long and horizontal. Yes. So we, I, I repainted a bunch of different people from the community from Darndale and, and used them in this idea of the Last Supper. Yeah. Now this is only using Da Vinci's motif. It's nothing to do with religion. We're not, we're not mocking Christ. We're not, I painted myself in the place of Christ. That's, I'm at the center of the table because they put me at the center of attention down here. Yeah. In, in Darndale, they welcomed me in and treated me like somebody I was really special, like a celebrity, and put all my work up on the walls, and 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 that's how that's the welcome I felt. Sure. So this is a celebration of the community in Darndale and what they did for me as an artist, right? So um, people who accuse me of you know you're blaspheming, you're claiming to be Christ or mocking Christ. In front of me, there's a bunch of different paraphernalia that um, that reference my character that are specific to me and my character. And one of them is a broken piggy bank. You can see the pink thing there. Mm -hmm. Right now, that's a confession. It means I can't save. I'm not able to save. So I'm saying I'm not the Christ. Calm down, yes. you know. And also in front of me, there's like banana and fruit cakes. That's a reference to me as an artist. I, I have a mental illness diagnosis. I'm paranoid schizophrenic, so I'm a bit bananas and fruit cake sometimes. So that's a joke on myself. So this painting uh, of the astronaut is called the... The Caucasoid. The Caucasoid, right. And it's touching upon the idea of in the future where the white race goes extinct. I'm not focusing on race because um, for no other reason than everybody else is. Right, there's a, there's a huge anti-white sentiment sweeping through the West from America that we're, we're public enemy number one. Our, our numbers on, on the board, statistically, our numbers are declining rapidly because of uh, low birth rates in the West, that white people are not having children, they're aborting the babies. Um, the governments aren't encouraging us, our race, to procreate, to have more babies. They're not making uh, tax incentives like uh, Hungary did. Um, I have a complaint about the governments, why they're not warning the people that were be going to become a persecuted minority on the world stage. If it's not already happening, it will happen at some point in the future. Specific to Ireland as well, the Irish people are going to become a minority in Ireland. It's a serious topic for us, the indigenous Irish people, and nobody's talking about it. The government are not addressing the problem. The UN are referring to it as replacement migration. That's what they call it on, on the official documents. Mm -hmm. um, we're being replaced. And we're being, we're going to be outnumbered, and we're going to be persecuted, because the the growing anti-white sentiment, growing in the West, is is gaining steam. Mm, so it's a, it's a very it's a very divisive topic. Um, people will say, you know, you're white supremacist and all this because you're talking specifically about the white race and trying to celebrate what they did and everything. That's that's racism, you know. Um, I would disagree. I'd, I'd say I'm a white survivalist. I'm concerned, gravely concerned about the uh, well-being and health of my own race. You, you very seem to very passionately believe that the white male is disenfranchised. Totally, it's, it, everything's against them. You know, like there's the warning signs left, right, and centre. Like it's it's not possible as a white man in England to apply for a job in the BBC, right? They were they're telling actively telling people if you're white, don't apply for the job. Right, so you're being treated, treated like a second-class citizen. Um, so it's a huge issue, and the government aren't addressing it. We, we're in a climate now where there's a lot of resentment about um, uncontrolled mass immigration in Ireland. You know, um, it's, it's a problem that's, if it's not addressed by the government properly, and the people aren't given a voice, it's going to become fester and become a terrible problem for our children to inherit in the future. Well, I love, I love to paint. It's, a, it's kind of a therapy for me to, to get my head down at the easel and spend hours painting the painting, you know. It keeps me out of trouble. I'm diagnosed uh, paranoid schizophrenic. Okay. On the books, I think it was chronic paranoid schizophrenia. <laughs> okay, but 
and you come across as such a rational, well-balanced human being. Well, now I'll put that down to um, when when I first became psycho psychotic in college. The experience was I was 28 years old. I was studying for a degree in art in um, the Leary, and I was heavy into um, learning about developing my art. So I was heavy into metaphor and allegory and making illusions and subtle suggestions through uh, visuals. And um, something happened, something strange happened that I exhausted myself in my work and it triggered a psychosis. And um, metaphor became a huge part of the psychosis and the psychotic experience. My, my sense of perception changed where everybody around me, all these strangers on the street were having their own conversations and I'm being bombarded by these conversations and everything they seemed to say was like metaphorically referring to me. So metaphor came into it a bit in a big way. Um, so it seemed like everybody was talking about me and everybody knew my thoughts and um, everywhere I went, even through the television, sound bites, adver adverts, everything was, speaking. everything was metaphorically referring to me. And it was a very powerful experience. So I developed, the, the psychiatrist said I developed um, delusions of grandeur, right? So, and uh, persecution, you know, because, because the experience was very negative, it seemed like everybody was mocking me and laughing at me and, and sneering at me and calling me all sorts of names. It must have been horrific too. It was a powerful experience, yeah. Um, it nearly cost me my life when I was young because of the... Um, because of the erroneous beliefs that I developed in the psychosis. And can you tell me, bro, how did you arrest this situation? How did you? I was, it was a persistence of, on the part of my family and the mental health system that they took me in. And um, I think they just kept on, kept on pushing me to get the treatment, you know? I think I, 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 think I spent the first time I was in, in the hospital for about six months with a stubborn psychosis. And I had a really big problem with um, accepting the medication, right? Yes. I wouldn't take the meds. I didn't. I believed in the reality so much that I didn't realise that I needed the medication. I had. It was. It was described on a report that I had a gross lack of insight, and that means that I had absolutely no clue that I was mentally ill, and I needed help. And <laughs> I just bought into this new reality, and it was. Uh, it was an amazing, powerful experience. But it was, it was in the treatment th that they did break through and I did reach the epiphany that there was something wrong with me and what I was thinking was not right. And that was the life-saving moment that I said, I need these medication. Mm -hmm. so, what were the medication? The, the medication I was on was solely on. I'm still on them. Amisulparide. It's a, an atypical modern designer drug. And it works a dream for me. It's like a miracle cure. I don't even suffer side effects now. Well, I'm so happy to hear Well, I'm very lucky. You know, I feel so um, so lucky that there's so many young people that the medication, they have problems with it and it's not working and they're on diff, this and that medication. And I just take uh, one maintenance dose a day and I'm all right. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, I'm very lucky. And thanks, thanks be to God, as much as I could give out about the, the one or two nurses who um, made the experience of living hell for me, the most part, I have to I have to praise the um, staff in the hospital. You know, they're dedicated people. It's the last job anybody would want to do. I'm so happy to hear that somebody that really appreciates uh, uh, the benefits that the HSE, the mental health, has been able to afford you. I hear a lot about oh, they put me on this and they shouldn't be on that. Yeah, it's it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one because when you're forced onto medication mm -hmm. and it comes with really negative side effects, you kind of resent it. You know. So I'm, I'm speaking as somebody on a pedestal. Right. I'm speaking down to the people who are suffering, suffering all the horrible yeah, side effects. I'm speaking really down to them saying, I don't suffer anything, ha ha, I'm not great. I don't think you're speaking. You know, um, so I'm very lucky. I, think I, I, yes. I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't suffer any side effects. No, unless, no. unless my political beliefs are side effects. That's another story. <laughs> yeah, that's here. a completely yeah, different yeah, story, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's incredible the work you do and I, you're out here and for anybody who's interested to see some of Emmanuel's work, out here you can visit the Bell Camp Centre out in Darndale where you can come into the foyer and look at these wonderful, wonderful paintings that Emmanuel's done and um, 
and uh, for you to look at here, and there is a lot more than uh, you will see just right here in the foyer of the bell camp. But um, yeah, I think your stuff should be on the global stage, bro. Ah, uh, well, well, you know what I said about that. I don't care what happens to my career. I'm an artist, but I'm not an artist with a career. I just, I'm an artist who likes to paint. That's the only uh, true artist. Artists um, with careers are, 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 are not really artists. It's sort of an oxymoron. Well, it's... The true artist is... I learned, I, learned, I learned last week about a fella named Keith Baudouin. He's a modern artist who paints by squirting paint out of his anus onto a canvas. Right? That says it all. My that friend. says it all. Right. And, yeah. um, and a person like me who paints with the quality of paintings that I do today, that I can't even get a degree in a left-wing college, that I'll be booted out, right? That'll tell you everything you need to know about the art world today. It's, um, it's, it's a terrible world. thing. But it's great to see in such a, for what you described as what would have been your, your uh, normal mental state pre-medication, and to sit here before you today, to look at the work that you've composed, done, and to also to talk with you, Oh dear, I'm one card short of a full pick. I'm not quite the shitty, one wave short of a shipwreck. I'm not my usual top billing. I'm coming down with a fever. I'm really out to sea. This ghetto is boiling over I think I'm a banana tree Oh dear I'm going slightly mad I'm going slightly mad It finally happened, happened It finally happened it finally happened I'm slightly mad Oh dear Or even uh, having a private view of, of the work. I do, I do go to tours if there's enough people. No guitar kickers either. No, if <laughs> if there's enough people interested, I'd, yes. I'd, I would do a guided tour and talk it through all the paintings. Well, I could talk for hours. I could stand in front of a painting and talk for hours, you know. Like yeah. that one there, that's called The Deed. Yes. See that one? That's a Caravaggio copy, isn't it? It's a Caravaggio copy. Now, that was painted, the drawing is a little bit off. I was painted that when I was a little bit unwell. But that's called The Deed, and that's about the idea of... Um, 
not just the deed yes. of taking Christ, but also literally a deed, as in a deed pole. Okay. And you can see my, my pet cat, Epi, up there. Oh, right. yes, yes, indeed, yeah. So it's kind of autobiographical, right? Okay. So there's references in there to specifics in my life. Sure. Um, so that's what I do. Uh, enough about me anyway, while we're here, do you want to, um, do you want to have a look at your painting? I absolutely do. Right, I'm okay. Excited. I'm going slightly mad. I'm going slightly mad. It finally happened, happened. It finally happened.